thank you for visiting Pastor Wyatt TV, the YouTube channel of PastorWyatt.com. Tracking trips with Pick 6 King, John Stetton. It's one of the best tools in horse racing for any level of player. It's your second set of eyes. Spotting troubled trips, betting angles, track trends, horses to watch and favorites to fade, 10 figs, ticket structure, and more. At Tracking Trips, you're a friend with benefits. Not a member? You must hate winning money. Join Tracking Trips now. Visit pastthewire.com and we'll see you in the winner circle. Remember, nobody does it better. History remembers moments of extraordinary strength, skill, and determination. True greatness is forged by those who fulfill their destiny. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Unfiltered on Past Wire TV with Michael Wilson, myself, John Stanton. Uh, another interesting show lined up. A couple of different topics to cover this week. Um, how are you, Michael? I'm good. I'm good. You know, obviously, as as you've been updated, was down in Florida last week, found a house, uh, made an offer, was accepted. So, you know, should be heading in that direction, you know, hopefully mid-January. Um, but yeah, no, exciting to kind of go down there and get a little tan and then come right back up to the cold of Kentucky. <laughs> well, well, welcome to the Sunshine State, um, or soon to be welcome to the Sunshine State. Uh, I've lived here quite a while. Pros and cons. I think the pros far outweigh the cons. Um, nice place to live. Great weather year round. Um, hurricanes being the exception, but Hopefully you'll avoid those. And uh, I think you're in a really nice area. I lived there for many, many years. Have a lot of friends there. Very nice. Getting very, very crowded and popular um, because it is nice. Uh, and I think you'll like it. Uh, I will tell you this. You're probably underestimating the time travel from where you're going to be to Gulfstream Park. Um, you do get yourself a good a good deal of traffic, especially at the, at at the peak hours, and a lot of the traffic is getting to and from the highway. Okay, you you probably wind up taking ninety five a lot, um, and it's not ninety five. Ninety five is bad, but it's not ninety five that's that bad. It's getting to ninety five. Um, that that can be a little bit of a of, 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 a, of, of a time drag so but you get used to it you know what I mean and uh what I what I did in 1990 when I moved that down here I said you know what I ain't even gonna worry about this traffic I just started buying really really nice cars Ferraris S-Class BMWs 7 Series Beamers convertibles all kinds of nice cars I would change it every year and I would just cruise down A1A along the beach and just take the slow road um, with a Dunkin' Donuts or a Starbucks and not even worry about it and just cruise there, cruise back and not even deal with the nonsense. Just, you know, take the beach scenic route and enjoy, you know, stop and smell the roses, as they say. So there's something to be said for that. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it was awesome just kind of seeing the different areas and you know, kind of for us, it made more sense to be, you know, close enough to Palm Meadows that it's it's quick to get out there and then kind of, yeah, it might be a little bit longer trek to Gulfstream and we'll do that a couple times a week, but you know, it'll be nice to kind of be able to balance between the two places and, uh, you know, who knows, you know, maybe I'll get a rowboat and I'll row down the canal from uh, from where we are down to Gulfstream and just park it somewhere. Yeah, no, it's a, it's just a, it's a, it's a lot of fun, man. A lot of boating. Um, a lot of people have boats. Um, 
You'll enjoy it. There's a, 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 you know, there is a lot to do and, and, you know, a lot to be said for living in, in Florida. It's a, it's, it's an interesting place for sure. Um, they race at Gulfstream all year round, which, uh, you know, it's always, always, always a nice thing. And, uh, you know, you could trek up to Ocala for the sales and for the, uh, little racer that they have up there once a year, which is, uh, you know, interesting. It's, uh, you know, Ocala, I think is underrated as horse country. I don't know how much time you've actually spent up there and looked at some of, of their farms. I mean, it's not quite Lexington, um, but is it is horse country and it does have some absolutely beautiful farms and, you know, beautiful areas. Um, and for horse people, it's definitely a place worth visiting. Yeah, no, I love Ocala. I mean, obviously we broke almost all of our two-year-olds in Ocala at a couple different spots. So went down there a ton and it'll make it easy, obviously, you know, though, though that's going to be our home base, I still will be kind of all over the country in terms of racing, you know, always planning on kind of doing summers in Saratoga and, and organizing spring and fall in Kentucky and then being down there in the winter. So just kind of obviously makes it easier on the circuit a little bit, but uh, you know, we still got to, be everywhere where we're at you know obviously Kentucky's home to the sales from beginning of September through you know even coming up we've got the January sale um and then you've got the February sale and then luckily the two-year-old sales are mainly in Florida um actually pretty much yeah mainly in Florida there's a couple outside of the state obviously Timonium and some in California and the one in Kentucky at Keeneland they don't do anymore but um, yeah, it'll make it central. It'll make it a little bit easier kind of on our schedule and, and have a lot of fun. But, you know, I think we've got some interesting topics to jump into this week and, and, uh, you know, you and I'll be recording from Florida probably in, you know, a month or so, but we can jump in about what's going on in racing right now. Yeah. Um, b before we get there, I would be re remiss if I didn't say a little something about, um, the, the the passing on Sunday of uh, JJ Grassi, um, who is the winningest trainer in the history of uh, Atlantic City race course. Um, you know, won, won, won an awful lot of races. He was a perennial leading trainer there, uh, leading owner there and contributed a lot more to the sport of thoroughbred racing than he ever really got credit for because he really wasn't the type of guy that sought credit or put himself in the limelight um but he was a true race tracker who truly cared about the game uh, he did an awful lot for the jockeys guild when they were in danger of going bankrupt most of that was behind the scenes a lot of people don't realize this he was you know heavily involved in media he's actually the one that started the the, the current show at the races which is probably the most popular show in racing with Steve Bick. He was, you know, the original guy on that show and Steve Bick wound up getting the show and uh, wound up going on Sirius Satellite Radio, XM Satellite Radio, whatever it is. Um, he did an awful lot for racing. Um, he entered racing in, I believe, 1962, um, left when they had to carry him out and uh, never, ever, ever lost an ounce of his passion and or enthusiasm for the sport. Uh, he was a unique Damon Runyon type character. And what I liked about him, and I, I would say would define JJ as a, as a man, is not any of the accomplishments or, 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 or accolades that he, he built up in the sport of Kings, which I feel are 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 enough to write a book about honestly um but he was the kind of guy who spoke his mind he was unfiltered um no pun intended and you knew exactly where you stood with him you know what i mean he wasn't uh, a guy to pull punches he told you you know how he saw it and why and he and he held firm to his convictions and he was one of the first people that in the industry that believed in, in past the wire and, 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 and what I was doing. And, uh, you know, he was just a no nonsense guy. I had never been on any kind of radio show or never did anything publicity wise. I had written a couple of columns 
And JJ reached out to me and said, can I have your number? I'd like to talk to you. So I sent him my number. I had never met him. I hardly knew who he was. And he goes, listen, I do a live radio show from Gulfstream Park every day in the paddock. Um, we're on the radio and he told me the station. He goes, I read a couple of your columns. You seem like an interesting guy. You write well. I'm like, thank you. Um, I don't necessarily agree, but thank you. Um, he goes, I'd love to have you as a guest on my show. I was like, wow, me on a radio show. Never dreamed of it. So I said, okay, um, you know, yeah, I guess that would be great for Pass the Wire. I think I could get myself, you, you know, mentally prepared to do that. Why don't we talk like in a week or two? Um, and, you know, we'll figure it out and we'll set something. He goes, no, 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 I'm going to do a week or two. We're live on the air at two. I'm calling you at three. You're set for the three o'clock guest. I'll call you back. Be ready. Click and hung up. Three o'clock, the phone rang. We're live on the air with John Stanton from Past the Wire, but he just went into it. And that was my introduction to being on live radio or any radio or any type of media whatsoever. Um, ultimately, we went, came, you know, we became friends, did many shows together. He wrote for Past the Wire. We did all kinds of stuff together. Um, he led the campaign um for a fleet alex when he was going for the triple crown with that whole lemonade thing and, and and i mean he just did so much but he was a really really good guy and if you were a friend of his and you asked him something he never said no he never said no to, to me he helped me every step of the way so i'm sure he'll be missed by a lot of people in the sport um my my condolences heartfelt and sincere condolences to all his loved ones and all his family. And as a, as a personal friend, I'm, I'm really sad. I will miss JJ. Um, we were in communication right until the very end. Um, when he didn't answer my last text, I kind of knew it was a really, really bad sign. Um, but we knew what was coming. He knew what was coming. He faced it head on. Um, and, uh, you know, he told me a lot of great stories that he told me I was free to share once he was gone that a lot of people are not going to like. And, you know, if and when the time comes to do that, you know, I, I, I just may. Um, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But JJ, thank you for everything. Um, you were you were a true friend. You stood by me. Um, you backed me every step of the way. You always had my back. And um, I personally will never forget you, how you were with me and all the contributions you made made, made to the sport of King. So uh, rest in peace, my buddy. And I'll see you on the other side. JJ Grassi, he was, a, he, was a, he was a good guy. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that to me yesterday, and obviously, you know, hearing I I did not know JJ, and you know, just hearing kind of what you said just sounds like an incredible individual, and obviously, as you mentioned, touched the sport in so many ways. So, you know, huge loss to the sport, and you know, it's it's uh, it's a great great uh, thing that you did in terms of writing what you did for him yesterday, and you know, appreciate you taking the time on this show, John, to make sure that you say a couple words for him. So incredible individual sounds like. Now he, he was extremely passionate about this next subject. I'm not going to speak for him. I'm going to kind of more pick your brain about it because, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I suspect you have some strong opinions about it and I'm sure you have some good knowledge about it, but bleeding, OK, and I'm going to try not to. And I don't know that we're going to be successful, but I think we should try and separate the bleeding issue from the Lasix issue, because the Lasix issue has been pounded and pounded and pounded and pounded. Let's talk primarily about bleeding, why horses bleed, how common is it? Uh, just really, let's explore bleeding and 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 we'll use two two blatant examples. One was the Hylas tribe incident the other day, um, which we talked briefly about off camera. And then we'll go back to, and I apologize, I should remember the horse's name, but it was a Joe Orsino horse 
that ran on a big day and it was a nice, nice turf sprinter and it ran on, on, on a stake day. I don't think it was the Breeders' Cup, but it was one of the big races. And the horse came back, obviously bleeding. They had taken the horse off Lasix for the stake race. It was an, an, an older turf sprinter. And he was very upset on camera, you, you know, about that and, and whatnot. So let's talk a little bit about that, the reaction to Tyler's tribe. Um, he was running back relatively quickly, um, not unheard of quickly, but relatively quickly off a, you know, poor performance in the Breeders' Cup. He bled. Um, let's let's let, let's really get get into why horses bleed. Um, how bad is it? How serious of a problem is it? Is it worse now than it was 10 or 20 years ago or 30 years ago um, before Lasix was used as widespread as it is now? And, you know, how do we deal with it? Yeah, I mean, you asked the, the question, and I think the answer is kind of in what it's termed as. It's, it's exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage. Now, a lot of people think that it's strictly due to exercise. Um, kind of in my experience, what I've found with bleeders, you have some horses that are just more prone to it than others. Um, there's, from what I found in a training environment, uh, there's a large correlation between speed um, and then also underlying soreness in a horse. So underlying soreness would potentially cause the horse to stress more, to work harder, to kind of do the fast-paced work race. Um, so overexertion is literally probably, if you wanted to sum it up, would be overexertion would cause it. Um, and it. And it can depend. I mean, we do see it a lot in sprinters. You do see it in some route horses. Um, you know, a lot is case by case. So you know, to, what I always noticed was if you could try different training tactics to strengthen the lungs. One of the things that I noticed uh, when we trained was when we'd have horses that were bleeders, if we'd two minute lick them more, you know, 15 seconds of furlong for a mile um, or even further, sometimes I'd two minute lick horses a mile and a half, which people thought was absolutely crazy. Um, but you're, you're preparing the lungs for those fast paced, 12 second or furlong works. Um, and when you do that over time, certain horses that were bleeders can handle it a little bit better. Um, some of it's environmental. I mean, there's certain tracks that we know every time Saratoga rolls around, that's a track that horses that never bled in their life will become bleeders. Um, whether it's environmental and allergies or the humidity, um, but you know, always we would take horses to Saratoga and you'd hear multiple trainers say it. Um, you go is it, and- Is it more common in hot weather as opposed to cold weather? It's a good question. It's a good question. I mean, I, do I remember it at Aqueduct in the winter with a lot of the horses? No. Uh, do I remember it in Saratoga? Yes. Um, so I think that's actually, it is an interesting statement that you made. Could it be- I mean, if you think about it, right, if you're running, though it might be, you know, it might feel a little different on your lungs. If you're running in the cold winter uh, versus hot, humid summer, you're usually overexerting yourself when it's hot and humid out. It's harder to breathe when you're actually exercising in that environment. So that could be a big piece of it. Um, but a lot of it comes down to horse by horse. And, you know, you'll see certain horses that never bled and all of a sudden they something happens in a race and and they bled and you know they came out with a little bit of soreness to coincide with that so those are the the things that we see and that i see um more or less do we know more about it in the united states now yeah because you know if you're talking prevalence of bleeding we scope everything right now. Every time a horse works, it's scoped. Every time it races, it's scoped. Uh, before, you know, unless it came out the nose, you weren't really looking for it. You know, before endoscopic exams became commonplace. Um, you know, it was interesting, claimed to Philly uh, for a client the other day at Turfway, and she'd never run on Lasix. Um, ran a phenomenal race, probably one of the best performances of her career run second beaten a nose and we're all chanting as she's nearing the wire please don't win please don't win please don't win because we we don't want to lose the condition 
um, and she gets beat. Um, and, you know, the trainer that we claim the horse with asked the previous trainer, why'd you never run her on Lasix? And sometimes you'll have horses have reactions to Lasix, uh, adverse reactions. Um, and so you won't run them on Lasix because of that. They'll be dull or lethargic or um, it just won't, it'll have the opposite of what you're hoping to achieve with it. So she said, well, I didn't think she needed it. And we said, okay, you didn't think she needed it. She says, but I've never scoped her, so I wouldn't know. Interesting statement. So, you know, we asked the vet, and this is a three-year-old filly that's never been scoped, uh, asked the vet, hey, can you scope this filly so we can check and see? And he scoped her, uh, you know, and, and it was first time she had an endoscopic exam. So she wasn't thrilled by it, but obviously we performed it and found out what we need to find out. But the vet at the end said, well, if you waited five more minutes, you wouldn't have needed me. Uh, basically, it would have come out the nose. So that's the thing. Old school horsemen used to, well, if the horse ran well, uh, we don't need to scope it. Um, or uh, unless it comes out the nose, it's not a true bleeder. Um, now, obviously, with endoscopic exams, we can look and see even if there's the tiniest trace of blood after a breeze or after a race. Um, so it's very different how we judge it nowadays. You, you know, know, and you, you, you're kind of answering a, a, an old question of mine, and, and, and I think um, it's going to clarify something that I think comes up repeatedly because I don't think I'm the only one who asks it, but a lot of people say, you know, Way back, you know, when, you know, Naira was the leader in racing in the United States and really the benchmark for, you know, winning a championship, you had to be able to run in New York to win a championship and Lasix was not legal. And if you had to run on Lasix, um, you had to ship out of New York and you were considered basically a second stringer. Um, right. Even shipped out for a stake and, and, and won. And the question has come up from myself and many others many times, well, you know, how come back then we were able to run so many horses not on Lasix and today they run on Lasix? Are they bleeding more? Um, are we breeding bleeders? Um, is the overuse and legalization of Lasix contributory to that? And you brought out an interesting point that I really never thought of. Um, they weren't scoping all those horses back then. So theoretically, and I don't think we could ever notice because it's not like we can go back and scope them now, but theoretically, it's possible that nothing has changed as far as the frequency in which horses bleed. We just did not know it because the minute bleeding or the bleeding that did not come through the nose could have been going on and could have been undetected and could have been unaddressed because we weren't scoping horses. So is, is that... Is that a correct assessment based on what you're telling me? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think that's a very, it's the same thing that what I talk about when we talk about sales horses, yearlings, two-year-olds, whatever, right? So as a horseman, you know, when I received a horse, when I was a trainer, I checked the horse and look for inflammation and, you know, check the legs. But if there was no inflammation, there was no heat and the horse was sound, I didn't go digging and looking right? Horse is sound, no issues, never shows it. You know, now you're at a stage, even in the sales process, where we radiograph everything multiple times. And, you know, you could ask, and that's the hard part when you're a buyer, and you can ask a consigner and say, has this horse ever had an issue with this? And they say, no, you don't know if they're being 100% honest, or if they're just saying what they need to say to sell the horse. Um, my point in that is, if it never, if, if you never saw any signs of it, which is true horsemanship, you're looking at the horse every day. If the horse never showed you any signs of it, you'd never go digging and looking. So sometimes even as trainers nowadays, it'll be like, oh, well, we know this horse has a chip in the left ankle. Well, that horse might have never shown any signs of pain, soreness, or swelling, but then you're constantly thinking about that left ankle. So I think the thing with bleeding is, you know, everybody's, you're so worried because once a horse bleeds, they're more prone to bleeding, right? The lungs, um, you need to give time for the lungs to heal so they don't bleed again when you have them overexert themselves in a breeze or a race. Um, 
you know, it's interesting. There's a horse that, that one of our clients has this summer that we claimed him and he bled. Um, you know, and then basically we started training him and, and training him harder and extending his gallops and having him do more. And, you know, we ran him and he won a race and then we had to run him in a stake and the stake had to be off leg six. And some were concerned that he might not, that he might bleed because he, he bled through leg six when we claimed him. We used scope clean, no problem, no issues, you know, and literally with that was, it was a horse that was not fit to be racing that was racing and bleeding through Lasix because he wasn't fit. And then once you got him fit, he, he doesn't bleed. So, you know, part of it is, you know, and you can go back and forth on it. Some trainers want to say, well, Lasix helps. Yeah, Lasix helps. It helps us help the horses. Um, some people want to say, well, America is the only one that uses Lasix. No, we're the only one that runs on Lasix. But other countries do treat their horses with Lasix when they do fast pace work. I'd seen it in England before with horses doing fast pace work. They're breezing and doing work on Lasix. We're just the only ones that are running on it, right? So um, does it help horses? Yes. Does it help us make sure that, you know, a horse that bled a little bit isn't going to bleed a lot? 100%. But there's also that form of everybody else is doing it it is a performance enhancer in some way you're at a disadvantage if you don't run on lasix so you kind of have to go with what everybody else is doing and run your horse on lasix even if they might not need it um and that's that's just where it's gotten to and and you asked the question if i breeze and this is how the the bleeders list works Okay, and I don't understand if people don't understand the bleeders list and how you get on it and how you get approved for Lasix. It's not like a horse walks into my barn and I say, I want to run them on Lasix. No, I have to show proof of bleeding. So basically the horse breathes, I'll scope it. There's a trace of blood, call Naira, say, hey, he bled a trace of blood. We want to put him on the bleeders list. He's on the bleeders list. He can run on Lasix. That's how it works. Um, do some people uh, falsify that information? Yes, because everybody's on the bleeders list. So uh, yes, but that's literally the process that you get on the bleeders list. You do have to scope the horse and have some evidence that there is bleeding. At least that's what the rules are. Well, and 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 I'll, I'll share a little something that I personally observed about about those rules. Um, uh, I was on the backside one time talking to a trainer, okay? And the vet was in the barn and there was a horse there that the vet was looking at and the trainer yelled over to the vet and said, hey, listen, I want to put that horse on Lasix, scope that horse um, and get him on Lasix for me. Um, and the trainer just looked over at him and said, yeah, no problem, we'll, we'll scope him. I'll find something and get him on Lasix. Yeah. It was very obvious to me standing there that bleeding had absolutely nothing to do with it. That horse was going on Lasix no matter what was found um, when they scoped the horse. So it was that easy to get to get a horse on Lasix and circumvent those rules, so to speak. So, um, I and here's here's that. where it's interesting, and 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 not to cut you off, John, but. Literally, we're watching the Breeders' Cup. Did horse run on Lasix in the Breeders' Cup? No. Tyler's tribe bled. That's why he was banned off because he bled, right? Does the Derby run on Lasix? No. Are we running most graded stakes races and most stakes race around the country off Lasix? Yes. Are those horses performing fine? Most of them. You know, there's a couple. And 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 here's here's the and there's that Joe Orsino horse. I wish I could remember his name because the, the horse did visibly bleed and he did he, you know voice his concern and and you know you know right on 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 the media coverage that you know they never should have made the horse run. You know he was an older horse that was used to running on Lasix and they took him off Lasix for this particular stake. Didn't didn't win and 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 bled and he was using that as an example of how wrong that practice was 
Well, and, and you can look at it in multiple different ways, right? Would we have ever had Zenyatta if we didn't have Lasix? No. Zenyatta, from what I've heard, was a very bad bleeder. Um, so, so the question comes down to this game is not fair. We know this game is not fair. Okay. You play the hand that you're dealt. If you buy a horse and it turns out to be a bleeder and the rule is nobody can run on lay six, well, so be it. I mean, I know it sucks that you spent your money and you have a horse that bleeds and, you know, and, and there's a horse, interestingly enough, we, there's a horse, another horse that we, we claimed over the summer and I like the horse a lot. And the reason why he was dropped in for 35 and he won was because the previous trainer said, look, he's the caliber of a New York bread stakes horse, but he's a bleeder. So we're never going to be able to run him off Lasix in a New York bread stakes. Better to dump him in for 35 and he can run around the claiming ranks and, and he can do okay. He's a good horse. Now sure. that horse hasn't bled ever since we claimed him. You know, he's, he's trained. We put him through everything. He's not bleeding. So I can tell you when we did claim that horse, that horse was sore behind. He had soreness problems. Now he's doing really well and the bleeding has gone away. So some, my point is the question then becomes what's, what do we want to achieve? Do we want to, do we want to do and pull the bandaid off and then, it, you know, we rebuild all at once or do we gradually phase out Lasix or do we, except that there's going to be some horse that are going to bleed and they're never going to reach their potential. And you just have to accept that's the hand that you're dealt, right? Just, just as much as bleeding is a performance enhancer or performance inhibitor, there's another huge performance inhibitor. What, what do you think that is, John? I don't know. Tell me. Slow horses, that's slow true. horses, right? So, yeah. so sometimes you breed a horse and it's slow. You accept it's slow, right? Sometimes you breed a horse and it's unsound. You accept it's unsound. We breed horses that bleed and some people want to accept it and say that's fine and others don't want to accept it and want to have LASIK so they can help their horse run. So it depends on, on what the goal is for the overall sport long term. Okay, Tyler's Tribe, I think is a fantastic Iowa bred horse. I mean, visually impressive was running him on the turf one of the worst decisions you could make yes that horse had no business being a grass horse you watch his stride you watch how he runs on the dirt i understand and maybe that's a race we need to consider in the breeders cup is a juvenile sprint right because we we have so many divisions now and most of our two-year-olds if we look at a card throughout the year right you have at saratoga you have five furlongs on the dirt that's pretty much all you have on the dirt until you get to the very end of the meet uh on the grass you have five furlong sprinting or you have a mile and a 16th on the turf right nobody runs long distance dirt races for babies early in the season because the way that we train in the u.s is go 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 and if you can you know trudge down the lane and last that's fine difference of when you run babies mile and a 16th on the turf you teach them to sit and accelerate it's different they don't have to be as fit for a route dirt race so knowing that the majority of our races in the united states are sprints for babies why don't we have a juvenile dirt sprint race right now granted tyler's tribe could have, would have still probably bled in that race you know because he was able to run on lasix in previous starts and had to come off of it but um you know, you look at it in a different way. I mean, the horse, they wheeled that horse back too quick, number one. You know, some people, when you when you have a horse bleed, like that horse bled, you need to give the horse at least five to six weeks to let the lungs heal, okay? You can do that in the claiming ranks. You can do that in the allowance ranks. You can jog the horse for a couple of weeks, gallop him a little bit, maybe get one slow work in him and run him in six weeks, seven weeks. You can't do it with a stakes caliber horse because they have to be fit enough to keep performing at the top level. So they wheeled him back far too quick, which is why he bled for a second time. Now, I don't know the rules uh, exactly as to the dates. I understand that they're saying we're gonna give him time and we're gonna bring him back. Also, if you look into the rule book of racing, 
When you bleed, you're on the bleeder's list for a certain period of time. When you bleed a second time, you're on the bleeder's list for a much longer time, meaning you cannot run. So yeah, he's getting time. Probably they're forced to give him time as well. Interesting. Um, what's your take on uh, alternative to Lasix uh, natural supplemental herbal type of uh, therapies, you know, legal therapeutic yeah, yeah. herbal type of uh, remedies for bleeders um, as opposed as opposed to Lasix. One of the best ones I found was halotherapy, salt therapy. Um, there was a unit built at Santa Anita when I was uh training there which was basically a salt chamber so you could load up two horses side by side and they'd have a 30 minute session where they're blowing salt into the chamber that they breathe in for 30 minutes uh royal ship okay mandela's big horse that won the pacific classic right he won the pacific classic or did he win which race did he win mm, i forget i think yeah maybe the san diego this horse from what i was told bled while galloping when he came up from South America. Horrible bleeder, okay? They started doing halotherapy. They got the bleeding under control and he's able to win a graded stakes off Lasix just because of the salt chamber. So I think the salt chamber is hugely helpful. Um, the herbal treatments I've found to be helpful, but here's the question. They helped but the horse still ran on Lasix. So we don't know how much it helped, right? Okay. You know, we'd do the herbal supplements and we'd get the horse better and the horse would stop bleeding, but we'd also worked on some soundness stuff and got the horse sound. And so then the question is, was it the herbs? Was it the herbs and the soundness uh, helped or was it the fact that, yeah, we helped, the herbs helped, but the horse was still on Lasix. I mean, I was never in a situation uh, during my time as a trainer where I had to, run a horse off Lasix. Um, you know, it wasn't a conversation back when I was, you know, at my height of training in New York. Interesting thing. And and and, and, and you you alluded to to the to the big misconception that we're the only country that uses Lasix. Yeah. Okay. Um you, you know I'm a huge fan of racing in the UK um ra ra racing abroad france ireland even, even australia I, you know I, I i love the racing overseas and the style of it and 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 um the fact that there does seem to be less race day medications allowed over there than there are over here and one of the like you said big misconceptions is that they don't use lasix and obviously you've stated that's not true um, they do use it. They just don't race on it, which is the primary difference. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people state, you know, oh, they don't use it over there. Um, can you talk a little bit about, and you've, you know, had a lot of experience overseas, um, you know, between the Darley Good Dolphin program and some of the people you've worked with, um, you know, in Australia and in England. Um, can you talk a little bit about their approach to bleeding, the fact that they don't run on Lasix, what they do to compensate for that, and what, what the real differences are between how bleeders are handled overseas as opposed to the United States, the, the factual stuff, the real stuff, not what everybody just conceives or perceives? I mean, it's it's similar to what we do, right? So so you can look at race day and say, oh, um, you know, it's not right that you run horses on Lasix. And to me, Lasix is a, I don't think it's a negative. I don't think it's a positive. I'm very neutral on Lasix. You know, can we probably get along fine without it? Sure. Uh, does it help? Yes. You know, so what people don't understand um, and I've never truly liked it, is what we kind of have to do if we're off Lasix, which is drawing hay and feed and muzzling horses for 
long periods of time, okay? Um, basically, what will happen is you'll draw, some people will draw the water bucket, you know, eight to 10 hours before the race, uh, draw a feed around the same time, right? Just lighten the horse up. Don't let them intake any fluids. Don't let them intake any feed. Um, and most of the horses, they don't like having a muzzle on their face, right? They, this is big, whether it's a mesh muzzle or whether it's a plastic muzzle, they, they can't eat. It annoys the heck out of them. They rub their face on the stall. They don't want it on them. And that's what we do. You muzzle a horse so they can't intake any fluids or eat um, because they can't have Lasix in the system to help kind of get rid of some of that uh, water weight. Um, and the other thing you'll see with Lasix is, you know, it's a diuretic. So on top of what will happen with, you know, them urinating a lot of water out, they'll also defecate a lot. So they'll remove a lot of that feed from their tract as well. So that's literally the alternative. Um, and that's what you would see. Now, I said it, I'd worked in Australia, I'd worked in Dubai, I'd worked in England, our horses breezing on Lasix and the places I was, they were. Um, you know, it wasn't, you know, I might go into a different trainer's yard and maybe that trainer doesn't use it. But in every circumstance I'd been in, the horses were mainly training on Lasix when it was fast paced work. Um, yeah. It was just different as to what you did as a protocol on race day. Now, me with Lasix, and I'll give you my exact protocol of how I, and some people cringed at what I did um, because trainers, not people. Um, my thought process was, I don't want the horse fully dehydrated. So what we would do is you get Lasix at four hours. I'd tell the grooms to pour out two thirds of the water bucket, but leave one third in, right? That way the horse, they're not going to drink buckets upon buckets of water to rehydrate, but there's enough there that if they want to sip water, they can have water. Um, if you look at it, carbohydrate availability uh, from digestion in a horse is usually six, you know, five to, to seven hours out. So we would feed the horses. And some people don't like feeding a whole lot of grain on race day. I was the opposite. I'm like, give them as much as they'll eat. But we're going to pull the grain at five hours out. Or the grain would leave when they're, as soon as they got the Lasix at four hours, we pulled the feed tub out. Okay, that's grain. Horses are grazers, right? So if you leave a horse in a paddock, what are they going to do all day? They're going to eat grass all day. Grass, to me, never caused an issue with bleeding. So I'd leave the hay rack up. They had a little bit of water. The hay rack's not going to do enough to where it's going to, you know, they're not going to binge on hay. You know, they'll binge on alfalfa and they'll binge on sweet feed. But they're not going to binge on Timothy hay. They're going to eat a little bit at a time. So it will help them not have gastrointestinal discomfort by eating a little Timothy every now and again. And then, you know, when you're putting, some people don't like it when you put on the bridle to have hay in a horse's mouth. We literally had, you know, we put the hose and just rinse the mouth out to get all the grass and feed out of the mouth. So nothing was in the airway when they did run um, in terms of, you know, accidentally sucking up uh, uh, hay and feed that was actually in the mouth. Um, so, and obviously horses breathe out of their nose. I know that. So if you're like, well, they're not going to breathe through their mouth. I understand, but it can still, you just want to clear their mouth, clear their, make sure that nothing can be in their throat. Right. Um, so we do that. Horses ran phenomenal, ran phenomenal. You know, I've been in other barns where they want to draw water at five hours. They want to draw hay at six. Um, to me, I wanted to keep the horse as happy and comfortable as possible, as relaxed as possible on race day. And basically, when bridle went on, they knew it was game time. Do you think we breed more bleeders now in the United States than we did in the past? It's a great question. You'd never know, right? You'd never it know. Back, it ties back to what we discussed earlier is lack of scoping and lack of... Yeah, we've got more endoscopic exams scoping these horses uh, and all of them, you know, run on Lasix, except when they're not running on Lasix and stakes races. So, you know, I think I think it's tough to really make the statement either way. Um, 
here's here's what we do know about bleeding and bleeding can go two ways usually once bleeding is a three it's a performance inhibitor um there are horses that run through bleeding so here's the simple thing with with racing uh and i'd seen it in barns where I remember there was a $1.7 million yearling uh, in Mandela's barn, a horse called Just Julia News by Gone West. Um, That horse, immensely talented, ran in his maiden race, looked like he was going to circle the field and draw away by 10. Uh, Bled a two out of five. Didn't, Didn't run a lick. Did not run a lick and never wanted to run a lick again. For whatever reason, the bleeding scared him, whether it was the taste, whether it was whatever, he he didn't like it, and he never ran again. When we breed racehorses, we breed racehorses to be tough, mental toughness. Bleeding, if they run through bleeding, is that a problem? No, because we're breeding them for what they're meant to do, to run and run well and run through adversity. So we could have had horses for years that ran through it, ran through pain, ran through bleeding, ran through it, bred, and we have a plethora of this. Bleeding becomes a problem when you have a horse that won't run through it. That's that's when it becomes a, a major issue. Um, and when it obviously in Tyler's tribe's case is, is out the nose because then you, you just can't get enough air. So that doesn't answer your question, but the, the question, you know, can't be answered. Can't with be def- answered. With affinity. Okay. Um, but you would have also, if you think about those those operations that you and I have talked about, where you you could not buy those horses, couldn't buy them, right? Those operations called horses all the time, so they would only breed what ran well, what bred well, what did you know the Claibornes, the Phippses, all those organizations, you know, and, and some of the greatest even in modern times judmont i've heard that judmont has a very had for a while a very strict culling program of if the horse doesn't you know we don't care if it was a, a good horse if it has these issues we won't breed it nowadays you know you see it and a lot of these horses are running at smaller tracks you breed anything that has four legs to anything that has four legs and and hope to i'm seeing it's interesting at turfway i'm seeing horses by sire and i'm like who the heck is this i've never heard of this horse you know so it's the same thing of anything responsible breeding you know if you breed responsibly you get better better athletes down the road um another major development in racing over the past couple of weeks and it was absolutely no surprise to me um i wrote about it after navarro pled guilty i think i wrote a column will jason service be next and i pretty much assured in that column he would plead guilty prior to trial if his motion to suppress the wiretap evidence was denied that motion was denied and i think it was only a matter of time until he pled guilty because his only possible defense at that point was you know having that motion granted and excluding the wiretap evidence because wiretap evidence in criminal cases is extremely strong you can't cross examine a tape recording you follow me it is what it is it's your client's yeah. voice on there um you, you know unless you have a very shrewd criminal client who knows how to speak extremely cryptically most of what you say, you know, a fish gets caught with it with with its mouth to open um, is it is it is a true statement. Uh, so Jason service has pled guilty and is facing four years in what I would call is probably going to be a club fed situation, which is a a federal prison, but it's a camp and uh, this will fall under the category you either know or you don't know. Um, but there are pretty much four ways to serve time, okay? There's county jail, which is absolutely the worst way to serve time. Fortunately, for those who wind up in a county jail, it's usually limited state by state to one year. So if you're sentenced to 366 days as opposed to 365, you go into state. 
And as bad as state prison is, um, it's a lot better than county. County is the worst. Um, it's filthy. It's, you know, known to be temporary. Uh, nobody cares about it. Nobody takes care of it. Nobody cleans it. You have absolutely no rights there whatsoever. Um, and it's a, a completely miserable experience, especially if it's more than just an overnight drunk stay, you know, if it's, you know, you're waiting for trial or, or being held for, you know, a couple of weeks or months pending bail or something like that. Um, there's not many worse places to be than a lot of county jails. Um, state time is horrible. Um, and that's where you see the scared straight scenarios play out and all those horror stories that you read about. Um, they're not, they're not fake. They're real. Um, maybe not as prevalent as, as, as you see, but it's, it's, it's no, no day at the beach. Um, but it's a lot better than county because you do have some rights, you do have access to certain things, you do have a, a, a permanent housing unit that you can keep clean with your cellmate and, you, you know, there's some structure and, 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 and whatnot to it. But it's far, far, far from fun. And I've always said that one of the uh, most humbling sounds in the world that if you've never heard, um, you can't really imagine or put into words is when the bars of a cell close, boom, and it makes that loud noise. Um, it's a humbling reality check for anybody. I don't care how tough you think that you are. Um, it's a game change. Um, then you've got federal prison and there are some federal prisons that are on a fall with state prison. They're tough and they're rough and they're not fun. Um, but they're actually a step above state because you do have some more rights and they're paid more attention to. Um, but again, it's not a lot of fun and it's not a great place to spend a significant amount of time. The last is the easiest and that's the club fed. Most of them are camps, minimum security. They're like real crappy motel sixes for the most part, except they have bars. Some of them don't even have bars. They've got TV rooms, gyms, libraries. Everybody there is doing, you know, easy time, so to speak. So no, most people don't want to get into fights if they don't have to. They don't want to make waves if they don't have to. You're not there with people that are doing life 10 times over who don't really give a crap and just want some excitement for the day or want to steal your shoes and see if you give them a hard time or, you know, see if you need a proctologist or something like that. I mean, all this kind of crazy stuff that happens in, in inside um, prison system. So Jason will probably be going to a club fed, okay? Which I believe is where Jorge Navarro is serving his time. And when guys like that, okay, go into those places, it's not as tough as it is for some other guys because he will be, I don't want to say a celebrity, but he will be a guy that people want to talk to because when you're in prison, even a club fed, who are you in there with? You're in there with people who like to commit crimes. Okay. And they will be picking his brain. How did you do it? What did you use? Can you get us some of that stuff? Can I know a guy in, in Ohio that knows somebody that runs horses. Can we hook him up and cash some bets? And he'll be somewhat of a celebrity at the card table and, you know, in the lunchroom and people will be wanting to talk with him. How much did you bet on this horse? How much did you make? What really happened? So it's not going to be um, as bad for him. I mean, it's not going to be fun but it's not going to be as bad for him as most people think. And as he probably thinks right now, because right now he's going through the reality check um, and that humbling experience of facing that your freedom is going to be taken away and you're going to be incarcerated. Um, and for someone who's not a hard guy and who's never been in that position before, uh, especially somebody older in life, you know, it's different when you're 17, 18, 20, 21, 22 years old, and you're ready for anything. You think you're the king of the world. You're about to find out you're not, but you think you are. Um, 
you know, it's a little different for those guys than for somebody who's in their 50s or 60s, you, you know what I mean, that's going to face this kind of thing for the first time, you know. Uh, so it's not going to be as bad for him as he thinks, okay. Um, it's not going to be fun, but it's not going to be as bad, 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 bad as he thinks. But he has pled guilty. Um, I don't think that's an unexpected result. I don't think, you know, the federal government's um, conviction rate at trials is what it is because they don't bring good cases. They do. They win a large majority and in the high 90 percent, you know. So he probably made the right move. Four years passes quicker than you think. If he gets the full four years, I tend to think he won't. Um, but that's that remains to be seen. But I'd like to explore with you a little bit about what you think the impact and meaning of of services guilty plea is to the industry. And I think that we should look at it in the, in, 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 in the perspective of here's a guy who on wiretap admitted to giving what the government says is a performance enhancing drug, what veterinarians have said on wiretap is an undetectable drug because there's no test for it to virtually all his horses, including maximum security, who was a Kentucky Derby first finisher, uh, albeit disqualified, but finished first in the Derby, finished first in the Haskell, um, finished first in what was it, the Saudi Cup or, 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 or whatever. Um, so he's basically altered racing history and done so um, under the influence of what the government says, and, 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 and I'm going to believe them in this particular case, under performance-enhancing drugs. And I'll say that you know, one thing I've learned about, you know, you know, criminal cases brought on by the federal government, they always know a lot more than you think they do, and then they and that they let you know that they do. But they never know everything also. So there's always things that they should know and they and, and they they don't. So I'm going to say, I believe that they know this is a performance enhancing drug, I believe that that that's a confident statement that they they make in their indictment. Um, what are the ramifications to the industry? What, 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 what I mean, it's changed history. It's a, it's 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 certainly a blemish. But you know what, what what's your take on it? Should maximum security still be considered um, an accomplished racehorse? Um, do we ask? asterisk his name like we did Bobby Bonds in Major League Baseball where you know you know he may never get into the Hall of Fame or, or or whatever I mean it's a complicated issue from that standpoint in my opinion um and it's an issue that I don't think racing as a whole knows how to deal with and has no uniformity and leadership to even direct how to deal with it um so what what's what what's your, what's your take on it I mean, my thoughts are, and I thought it was very, very honorable how uh, Gary and Mary West said, look, we'll, we'll give back the purse for the Saudi Cup. Um, you know, and they, they'd mentioned that as soon as service pled guilty. Um, to me, he's a horse, and I, I have a client who wanted to breed to him. And I said, he's a good looking horse. Let him prove himself. Um, and I think that's almost kind of the, to me, I can't look at an athlete, uh, you know, and, and I was a Lance Armstrong fan. Like I liked Lance. I thought he was great. And then, you know, the, the news came out of what it was and it's kind of like, you know, you almost have to scrub their entire career, right. And just say, who knows how good they were without, uh, and some people can point and say, well, he went to Baffert and he was still a good horse. And yeah, Bob did a good job with that. I don't think he was as good, honestly. He wasn't close. He wasn't close to as good. And 
You know, I, I don't think I, I watched that horse in California training. I think the horse had some issues that he was dealing with. Um, and so I think Bob did the best job with him that, that he could possibly do. Um, let me, let's say I'm Baffer and I got the call to take the horse. I wouldn't have taken him. Wouldn't I, have agree taken him. I, I, um, I, I agree with that. Because um, you're in a no-win situation. I, I, I agree with that. And I, I'll say this, and, 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 you know, my always take on it is, you know, a lot of people accuse Bob of being somebody that, you know, pushes the envelope and, you know, people outright call him, call, call, call him a cheater. Um, and I think that maximum security and the way that maximum security performed for Bob, as opposed to for service, argues against that. Okay. Um, I think it argues against that. I think it 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 it, it points to you know in Bob's favor that he's not using and not um, in possession of some magic elixir that um, causes these horses to you know rebreak, which we discussed. Half of them aren't rebreaking, and then people don't understand what rebreaking is. But I, I, I think it just you know, bolstered the argument that he is not maybe who a lot of people have labeled him and 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 say that he is, but that's not really what 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 we're we're, we're talking about here. But you know, he did take over the horse. I was surprised he did, but you know that was his decision. He trains for the Wests. Um, I don't know that I agree that what the Wests did as far as issuing that statement was as honorable as it is perceived. I think it was the right thing to do. Um, I think it could have and should have been done possibly earlier, but I think it was the right thing to do because it was really the only thing to do. Um, right. What were they going to say? You know what? We want to fight for the purse. You, 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 you know, I mean, I... I think it was one of those things that looked good, sounded good, but really had no teeth, in my opinion. You know, I mean, they they did, I think, what they were supposed to do. And I don't think that, you know, you commend anybody for doing for what what, what they're supposed to do. You know what I mean? Um, but that's just my take on it. You know, I agree with you about maximum security per proving himself. I mean, Chop Azteca is, is a horse that seems to be doing well as a sire. Um, you know, when all of this broke, I said, I would never breed to any of these horses that Navarro and Service sent out to, to stud. Um, I wouldn't breed to maximum security because going back to what I said earlier, the federal government always knows more than you think, but never knows everything. I don't know what these guys were caught giving this horse SGF 1000, whatever the heck that is, okay? I don't know what else they were giving him that they didn't get caught giving him. And if you think that they're going to say, oh, we weren't only giving him that, we were giving him this too, that's even better. That probably didn't happen. Um, so I don't know what these horses were given, and I don't know what the long-term effects on the breed or on the offspring of those particular horses could potentially be. And I don't want to spend my money to possibly find out. You know what I mean? I don't know what genetically these, these concoctions that these people drew up and, 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 and made and invented can possibly have on the offspring of any horse. And, you know, all due respect to each their own, you want to take a shot and breed to one of those stallions, all the power to you. And the shop acts Aztecas are surprising me and running better than I, I thought they would. Um, but I still wouldn't breed to him because right. again, I don't know. I don't know what he was given and I don't know what effect that can possibly have on a horse that I would, I, I, I would own. And I, I don't want to find out. Um, I would not have been opposed to the argument. Okay. That they can't breed those horses. 
I really wouldn't. I think I think I think we need to get that stuff out of the game and out of the system of, of, of the horses. And true, there's a lot of people that haven't been caught. So there's a lot of that stuff out there, stuff that we don't even know about out there. Um, but if we do know and we have people admitting, hey, we gave them this, this, this and this. Um, and that's not legal and not good. And it's synthetic man-made stuff that we don't even know really what's in it um i don't i don't i don't think we should be you, you know promoting our breed and and allowing that to perpetuate in 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 our breed of horses in a time like in any time but especially in a time like this when we're trying to work towards less drugs more uniformity healthier horses with lo more longer longevity and soundness. So I don't think, you know, I wouldn't breed to them. And I, and I would be fine if they said, you know what, we're sorry, but in light of this, sorry, can't breed. Well, I think part of it, you know, there's no drug that, so there's no, you know, I watch Marvel movies. There's nothing you can give that turns scrawny Steve Rogers into Captain America. It, there's, there's nothing on the planet that has that dramatic of an effect. So these horses would have had to have some baseline ability to start, right? Do I think Lance Armstrong was probably a world-class cyclist? Yeah, probably a world-class cyclist. Did the drugs take him from world-class to unbeatable? Absolutely. Same thing with maximum security. Is the horse, as he showed with Baffert, can he win grade ones? Can he win grade twos? Yeah. When you give him something else, is he unstoppable? Yes. Right. So I think part of it comes back to understanding what PEDs can do. Barry Bonds is a very good baseball player, very good baseball player. Then he found steroids and then he became a monster, but he was still baseline a good player he wasn't the kid who couldn't make he couldn't connect with the baseball and then all of a sudden he's on steroids and he's unstoppable roger so, clemens could probably strike you out with or without steroids 100 percent. so i think a lot of it comes down to people understanding that hey look what these guys and service you know i i know some individuals in the business who said i never saw it coming i never thought who would have guessed how could you not have guessed? This this guy forever was like an average trainer. He was good. He was okay. And then all of a sudden, bang, 33%, top trainer in the country. You can't get beat. But yeah, if you take a claiming 10 horse that was running for 10, you give him something, and now you can win for 20 easily, well, then all of a sudden your stats explode, everything explodes. I mean, there's two things. There's, if you think of a horse, right? A horse is no different than any human athlete. There's only three things. Well, there's a lot more ways. So if you're gonna get a, an, an athlete to perform at its peak, the, the things that you can do is help with energy metabolism, right? So to have more energy to burn, is, is one thing, you'll have more endurance and you'll have, I mean, basically sports comes down to energy expenditure. Um, and then the other would be lactic acid tolerance. Um, the third would be oxygenation of the blood. So you have more oxygenation in the blood, more oxygen in the muscles. You can last longer, you don't get as fatigued as easily, which is why we do high altitude training and you know, Olympians and professional athletes. And the biggest thing, which we don't know in the case, you know, and I haven't gone in depth, maybe they did uncover this, but it's what Bian Cohn was caught with, pain reduction, right? If you're at the gym and, and anybody can, can answer this question, there's two things that, several things that will limit you from getting the most out of your workout. One, how much energy do you have? B, how tired do you get? And see how much does it hurt, right? What's the burn? Can you handle it? Can you push through it? Can you not? So you still have to have some baseline. Anybody could go to the gym with me 
and anybody who's not at my athletic ability, I will wipe the floor with from an athletic perspective. And that you, I could give you everything in the world, you're not going to catch up to me. You'll close the gap a little bit, but, but unless you're at my level as an athlete, there's only so far you can go, right? It's the same thing with a racehorse. So I do agree we need to have more penalization in terms of saying, hey, look, if you guys are going to break the rules and you guys also need to, you know, there's, there's more effects within the chain on that, right? You know, Coolmore had bought the horse. So he stands at, he stands at Ashford. He ran in the Coolmore Silks in the Saudi Cup. Um, they should have to buy the horse back from you, right? I mean, there's got to be ramifications in that, right? So then the person who didn't, who, who made a financial commitment without understanding the full ramifications of it doesn't get landed, which is what happens in our sport all the time, with a bad situation. Um, that's kind of my view on it is the, the biggest thing in our sport is we've got to protect owners. We have to protect the betters. We have to protect the fans and we have to protect horse health and safety. So whatever rules you need to impose to do all those three things is, is kind of what needs to be done. And it needs to be done we tend to have knee-jerk reactions in this business, very short-term thinking, very short-term reactions. It needs to be done on long-term. Where do we want the sport to be in 10 years? What do we have to institute now to have the sport where we want it in 10 years? Because it's not going to turn around overnight. You're not going to get rid of most of these people overnight. But how do you weed them out over time? And how do you build to where you want the sport to be in 10 years? And that's the line of thinking that really needs to be had. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that the sport as a whole, and I'm, I'm excluding Heisa from this, but I'll put them on the spot a little bit here too, only cause I'm in just in that kind of mood. Um, I don't really think that the sport wants to clean up the game as much as they say they do. And I will say this. Okay. And I invite anybody who um, was involved in the service and Navarro investigations and the investigations um, of the other people involved in that. Anybody from HISA, any from body from what is it, the TRB, Thoroughbred Horsemen's Benevolent Protective Association, um, anybody from the Jockey Club, anybody from HISA to reach out for me for me to elaborate further on what I'm about to say. The main form of drug cheating, and when I say cheating, I don't mean legal overages, um, uh, uh, overages of, of legal therapeutic medications, I believe illegal, okay, I'm talking about illegal cheating, is almost completely ignored and unknown by the racing establishment. 100%. Hundred percent by the people that are charged with um, cleaning the game up. They have no idea how it's being done, why it's being done, and why so many people are getting away with it. And they're not even looking in the right place. That's how clueless they are. And here's a guy, a high school dropout with a with a, with a, with, a, with a silly uh, horse racing uh, YouTube uh, thing. Um, that knows more than them, okay? And if you want to know, I'm very accessible. Call me up. I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. I don't think nothing will ever come of it because I believe that the real concern is follow the money, handle the almighty dollar, big field sizes, and things of that nature. But the main thing that these guys are doing today and I'm not going to say what it is on, on the show because I want to see if anybody reaches out, if anybody's even listening or paying attention and wants to know, is completely ignored. They ain't even looking in the right direction. They're in the wrong ballpark, okay? Um, but that is, 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 is what it is. But I think that the service thing, to wrap that up, is, 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 is a blemish on the industry, but it's a blemish that we needed. Um, I'm not 
optimistic that it will go the way that we hope it goes as far as um you, you know future indictments and future cleaning up the sport and you, you know future standards we see all the you know problems with HISA and uh, arguing over whether they're looking at the the whip rules too much and now you know their drug protocols are not going to be challenged and 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 whatnot so that, it's it's a battle we did a show with Gadamer on on on, on some of the legalities right. that um so who knows where and when that's gonna going to resolve and how it, uh, how it's going to turn out. Um, let's I'll, echo, I'll echo your sentiment. I mean, I'll echo it. I, I, it was interesting years ago, you know, and you and I have had conversations off camera, why, why I got out of racing and, you know, the industry overall the first time um, and why I, I hung up training. Um, and then we had a conversation on why I came back and, and, you know, you would probably know why I stopped again. Um, I had a conversation and I think part of it comes down in our industry to it's a very high stakes game. When you're wrong, you're really wrong. Um, and there's a lot of ego tied up in it, but I had a conversation with somebody who regulated uh, one of the laboratories. And I quite frankly said to him, you have no, idea. I said, look, there are things going on on this backside that you are not testing for. And that was met with, I know exactly what we're testing for. We're on top of everything. And I said, no, you're wrong. There are things going on back here that you have no clue what is going on. And I, I will tell you this. I was offered what service was giving by a vet, okay? Vet said, we've got, we've got this supplement, is what he termed it as. We've got a supplement that speeds up ATP production. Well, I've done chemistry, done biology. I know what ATP is, okay? Right. How the hell are you going to have a supplement that speeds up ATP? It doesn't make sense to me how you're going to just magically create more ATP production in a horse and how that is somehow legal. So I asked him, I said, interesting, um, how does this supplement work? Well, it's an injectable. I said, well, if it's injectable, it's not a supplement, it's a drug, right? If, if it's gotta be put in and infused, in my mind, how my mind works, my dad's a vet, my wife's a vet, as a drug. So I said, look, I'm not interested, uh, but I knew other, you know, and he had told me, which trainers on the backside were using it. Oh, I give it to this guy and this guy. And so, you know, it's it's interesting even when, and, and that's one of the biggest frustrations in this game to me at times is I'm actively, I'm not trying to challenge you as a man. I'm not trying to challenge your ego. I'm actively trying to help you because I want to help you. People get me wrong all the time, okay? People think that I might be arrogant. I might know. I want to help people. My, my biggest goal in life is to help people. I love helping people. And if I give you information that you don't have, I'm not speaking out of turn about it. It's because I actively know something's going on and I'm trying to give you the information for you to go do something about it. And to be met with what I was met with and the guy was like, nope, know exactly what we're doing. You don't know what you're talking about. Da, 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 da. And I've run into that person recently. And I haven't rubbed it in his face. And I haven't said, hey, I told you. But when we've, there are good people in this game that want to fix this game. And, and there's another subject which we're not going to dive into that is frustrating me of how there are still lame horses running on the racetrack. And that there are still lame horses passing the state vet when you claim them and getting passed off to owners. That's still going on. It's, it's pretty bad, okay? Um, but if I give you the information to try and help it, to try and help it, if that's our overall goal as a sport, please act on that information and go do something about it. Don't just write everybody off that you're the person, the position of power, so you know everything. Nobody knows everything. I mean, we all make mistakes all the time. We're all humans. Everybody makes mistakes. 
I, 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 absolutely. And the proof of the pudding will be is I'm I, like, like I said on the show, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of something that's going on on a daily basis um, that these people have no clue about. Um, and I guarantee you my phone don't ring. So, well, and I'll take the calls, but won't, 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 won't ring guaranteed. Yeah. Um, last thing we want to talk about, and this is a sensitive subject for me, um, gets a little personal. So I'm, 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 I'm gonna, gonna do my best to, to, to keep my comments at a minimum. Okay. But you wanted to mention the eclipse awards and talk a little bit about the eclipse awards. Um, so I will allow you to do that and say what, what, what it is that you wanted to say. And I may weigh in a little bit. Um, I will say, I don't think the eclipse awards are nearly as important or as significant as they once were. Um, I've got some, some personal gripes with the NTWAB that I have long thought about writing an article about because I've got a folder of documentation of nonsense with them that I really think if it was ever, if it, if it ever got out, it would be a really, really bad look for them. Um, but I've held off on doing it because I just have not the time nor the patience. Um, but let's, let's hear your thoughts on, 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 the, on the Eclipse Awards. I think I think we've touched on two very hot topics. Maybe we can maybe we can shelve the eclipse awards, but you know, it was interesting people um I guess, you know, kind of trying to make statements on who deserves what. To me, I don't think there's much conversation this year. I think everything's pretty clear cut. Um, you know, again, would you in other years you know, look at horses with a bigger body of work as to who deserves horse of the year and then who deserves X, Y, and Z. Yeah, but nobody has a significant body of work this year. So, you know, horse of the year is pretty obvious. You know, uh, I don't need to say it, but it's obviously flight line. To me, Malathat is going to be, you know, champion Philly. Um, you know, two-year-old, you'd have to take your hat and put it on Forte. Wonder Wheel is the obvious two-year-old Philly champ. Um, you know, I think the only area where you might have gray is in the turf division. Um, to me, it's in Italian, uh, you know, at least for the U.S., if that's what we want to really discuss. But, you know, I've, I've noticed chatter on, on Twitter about the Eclipse Awards. This is one of the years, the only one that is potentially up for discussion is three-year-old male you know is it cyber knife or is it epicenter you know which one um you know and, and to me i'd honestly throw Tyba's name in that mix but again body of work he he didn't run as much as the other boys so um that was kind of my my you, you wouldn't throw rich strike in there just because no okay i'm just asking i didn't say i would i'm just just asking i mean the, the horse Look, the horse ran the Derby. The horse ran a great race against Hot Rod, Rod Charlie. Um, uh, and then the horse ran a clunker. So, you know, I think I think I'm a happy Rich Strike is around because I think with everybody retiring, he's going to be, you know, a force to be reckoned with in the four-year-old division if they do right by the horse um, and and give him whatever time he obviously needs. Um, so that's kind of the wrap. I, I really wanted to touch on what we touched on. And, and if okay. anybody has differing opinions on who deserves what and what, what division, um, by all means, you know, state your case. Elite, uh, elite power sprinter. Yeah, I mean, you ran two great races. I mean, you could argue either way. I'd, I'd honestly, in the sprint division, though you'd rarely see it. Um, do we have a female champion sprinter division or no? It's just no. champion sprinter. I throw, yeah. I throw, I throw good night all of it over him. I'm a little biased there, so yeah. I got no vote, so it doesn't matter. I think she had a great season. Absolutely. Think, yeah. You know, I think I think obviously what she did was was phenomenal. So 
I mean, that's the thing is if you want to get in arguments there, I mean, champion sprinter, if you really want to get in the champion. Elite sprinter. Power did run off uh, uh, some nice races, though, you know, at the end. And he did. Oh, he ran great. He ran great. I mean, but that's the thing. Champion sprinter is not surface related, right? I'm wearing a jacket right. of a horse that could deserve champion sprinter. Could be in the argument. No question about it. No yeah. question about it. Um all right. Um, interesting show. Hit a lot of things. I'm glad we kind of kind of steered away from the Eclipse Awards because I didn't really want to go down that path um, with the Eclipse Awards and the NTWAB. You probably could have goaded me into it, um, but it's just as well. On another show, we'll do it after the Eclipse Awards are up. We'll All right. All right. I've been I've been putting it off a long time, but I got to. I'll gotta, never let you vote at that point. If you go into, I, it, you'll never get a vote. I got to. <laughs> no, I, I already told him I don't, I don't want to vote what is that old joke i would never want to belong to any club that would have somebody like me for a member so um no nah, i'm I, I i i pass on the ntwab um with good reason but um one day i'll share i'll share my reasons why and i think a lot of people will agree with me but uh we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it always a pleasure um yeah. I, I i enjoyed this show again um, JJ Grassi, this one was for you. You you will be missed and you will not be forgotten. Um, and I know you were passionate on all these subjects that we talked about today. Uh, and always a, pl a pleasure, Mr. Wilson. We will re reconvene next week, I, I, I assume. Yeah, absolutely. So looking forward to it. All righty. Ciao for now. See ya. Dan here with some exciting news. DRF Formulator, the gold standard in past performance information, is now free exclusively on DRF Bets. Join DRF Bets with the promo code WINNING, get a $250 first deposit match bonus, a $10 free bet, and free Formulator already uploaded to your account. Access Formulator's premium features, including sortable trainer stats, race replays, personalized trip notes, and lots more. Free Formulator exclusively on DRF Bets. Nobody does it better.